Welcome to part two of our video on the president as chief economic planner. Uh, the previous video we looked at um, we looked at the business cycle and how the economy grows and goes down. We looked at our budget and how that's created. Uh, we also looked at uh, the uh, the crises that exist with our budget as well as the taxes that create the revenue for our government. So this video is going to be about how our government tries to influence the economy, not just with the budget, but with uh, two policies called fiscal and monetary policy. All right, so first let's take a look at uh, fiscal policy. The definition is it's the use of spending and taxes to influence the economy. This is the way that the president and Congress can most directly influence the economy. Last class we looked at this chart, uh, this graph illustrating the business cycle. Right? And you notice at the top, um, the, the economy is always ebbing and flowing. And at the top we have what's called a boom or a peak where there's full employment um, and typically high inflation. And at the bottom we have a trough or a bust where unemployment's higher and prices typically deflate. And notice at the top of this chart I'm illustrating that fiscal policy did not happen until the Great Depression. Right? Our government typically stayed out of the economy, but when the Great Depression happened, the role of government changed. People were looking for someone to help pull us out of this recessionary period, and fiscal policy was introduced. Right? And, and the whole goal of that policy is to try and keep our economy in a straight line of upward growth as opposed to always up and down with these vicious cycles that exist in a free market. All right, so if we're looking at fiscal policy, and it's again spending, uh, using spending and taxes to try and regulate the economy, if the economy were up at the top here, right, at a boom period, we would typically have full employment, high inflation, people are making a lot of money and they're spending a lot of money, and if a lot of people are trying to buy things like one house, the price of that house goes up, and eventually it becomes more expensive than anyone can afford. Right? So this becomes a problem, and it's why our government wants to regulate it or control it to some degree. So what can our government do with taxes or spending to try and help when our economy is in a period of high growth? One of the things they can do is they can either raise taxes, right? and by raising taxes they would pull money out of the economy, or they can lower government spending, which would again pull money out of the economy. Remember GDP, part of GDP was government spending. Right? Raising taxes is not a popular decision by politicians, so that seldom happens. And lowering government spending is tough as well, as we saw uh, in the previous video when the super committee tried to find ways to cut the deficit. Right? So typically it's difficult to pull us out of these high growth periods because uh, citizens typically enjoy them. Right? But where we're at in the economy right now is down here in this bust area. Okay? And what happens if the government sees the economy in a, in a bust or a trough? One of the things that they can do is they can lower taxes. Okay, lowering taxes gives people more money in their pocket and companies more money in their pocket and allows them to spend money and hopefully stimulate the economy. Also, the government can raise their own spending by funding projects. Let's say, for instance, uh, one of Obama's favorite projects to fund is, um, is uh, renewable energy sources like wind uh, power or solar power to give small startup companies uh, money so that they can grow and build factories and build windmills and whatever other things they can do to create jobs which then would lead to more spending and pulling us out of the economy. And whatever side you agree with is typically based on your political ideology. The first one, the idea of raising government spending to pull us out of a, of a recession period is known as demand side economics. Okay? And that includes deficit spending. Typically the government spending money that it doesn't have but spending with the purpose of trying to raise us out of this recessionary period. The creator of this, this theory of thought is a, name, a guy named John Maynard Keynes. Right here you see him down here pictured on Time Magazine. His theory was that we should grow government spending and that way we can, ex we, we can, uh, we can push the economy to get going again. Um, his quote at the bottom here, um, in the short term, push uh, a lot of government spending, like we said, can rack up deficits. His quote is that in the long run, we're all dead men. So we should first and foremost worry about the short term and creating jobs and getting the economy going. Typically, the more conservative you are, the more you agree with Ronald Reagan on the bottom left here in his view of supply side economics, which is known as the trickle down effect. Right? So instead of in growing government spending, the idea is that you lower taxes. And by lowering taxes, you put more money in consumers' pockets and in businesses' pockets, and they invest and spend more, which then, again, can grow the economy. Both of these have been uh, models that have been tried in the past, both successfully and unsuccessfully, and really it depends on your political ideology. Barack Obama is somebody who prefers demand-side economics. 
typical Republicans right now in Congress prefer supply side economics, which is why we're always debating about lowering taxes or s raising, uh, raising spending, okay? Uh, so that's fiscal policy. That's the way the President and Congress can influence the economy through spending and taxes. Indirectly, the President and Congress influence monetary policy. And the reason I say indirectly is because there's a central bank known as the Federal Reserve System that controls monetary policy. Right? It was created in 1913, uh, around uh, just before the Great Depression, to try and help monitor and control the economy so it doesn't go through many of these booms and busts. It's a totally independent agency, which means that their decisions are not controlled by the executive branch or Congress. However, they are accountable to oversight by Congress, where they have to testify and, and give reasons for the decisions that they've made. All right, uh, the, the members of the uh, Federal Reserve System are both public and private. There's private bankers and then public appointed officials that, that participate. But the decision-making body is known as the Board of Governors. And the members of that are approved, appointed by the President and approved by the Senate, and they serve 14-year terms. Right? Um, somebody, else, and somebody is also appointed as the President of that body, and right now that happens to be a man named Ben Bernanke. Right? And their job is to try to control the money flow by controlling interest rates. And we'll look at that right now. There are 12 regional Federal Reserve banks. One of them happens to be in Minneapolis in the ninth region. And then there is a central bank, which is in uh, Washington, D.C., where the Board of Governors meets. And what they do is they meet and they decide how they can best control the economy. So, for instance, when our government is at a peak period, when there's too much money in the economy, the Fed will make decisions to try and pull money out of our economy. When we're at a, a, a trough or a recessionary period, the Fed will make decisions that will put money into our economy to try and stimulate it. So let's look at that a little bit more in detail. The tool that the Fed uses to do this is called open market operations, which means buying and selling treasury bonds. Now, treasury bonds are basically IOUs that our government sells. And one of the things they can do is if they want to pull us out of a peak period, right? if there's too much money flowing, then the only thing that they need to do is sell treasury bonds to buyers that are willing to buy them. And by selling bonds, they pull money out of the economy, which brings us off this recession, this, uh, this peak period. Right now, currently, our government is in a trough or a recession. So instead of trying to get money out of the economy, they want more money in. And the way that they do that is they buy treasury bonds from the public. Right? And when they buy these bonds, they put money into the economy, which helps stimulate the economy. It also lowers interest rates, so it's easier to borrow money. So for instance, if you look here, here's Ben Bernanke. And here are the interest rates that the Fed has tried to control uh, throughout the last uh, you know, four years when we've gone through this recessionary period. And if you notice, they started at about 5.5%. And ever since then, they've been dipping, dipping, dipping. And now they're the lowest they've ever been. They've been at uh, between 0 and a quarter percent for the last three years, or excuse me, four years, with the whole purpose of lowering the interest rates, right, to try and encourage banks and businesses to borrow money, to loan money, because when money is flowing through the economy, it speeds up the economy and grows the economy. And they do all of this through open market operations um, and a couple other tools that we're not going to get into that you'll talk about in econ, but mainly in open mar market operations. The purpose of doing that or the way they do that is by is by uh, buying T-bonds, uh, which puts money into the economy. Okay? So we've looked at three ways that the government can influence the economy. By creating a budget and setting revenue and uh, spending policies, by using fiscal policy to try and increase revenue, uh, excuse me, increase or decrease taxes or increase or decrease spending to try and influence the economy. And lastly, monetary policy, which is the Federal Reserve trying to change the flow of money. So all three of these things go together and they lead us back to our initial question. To what degree is it fair to blame the president for gas prices being high? Now, this is a question that we'll talk about more in class if we have time, but I'll also leave it up to you to think about. If you can answer this question intelligently, then that means that you understand the concepts that we've talked about in these last two video lectures and will be set up for the assessments, this, this unit, and also the AP test. Let me know if you have any questions in class.